What's your favorite creepy campfire story? Gosh, let's see if I can recall it correctly. There was a body of a fairly large person, once found in the woods. They were quickly killed, and there was nothing extremely off about the scene, except he had half of his pointer, ring, and pinky finger all missing from his left hand. No one could find the missing fingers, and they never found any clues. A few weeks later, another body was found, another man who was a bit smaller than the previous guy. Same situation, quickly killed, and three fingers missing all from the left hand, and still no clues. A few more weeks went by, and this time it was a woman who was found, smaller than the second guy found, same fingers missing from the same hand. This went on for a while, with the victims getting smaller and smaller, until it was kids bodies being found. One teenager's body though, only had the ring finger and pinky finger removed. The police found a fingerprint at this crime scene, and they found it matched the prints from a theft record from the previous victim. The guy telling the story then told the kids that the killer was searching to replace his fingers, and so far, he had yet to see if the fingers of children their age would fit. He then took off his glove, showing he had a scarred pointer finger and was missing half his ring and pinky finger, and then lunged at the kids while screaming. He later told the kids he lost the two in a work accident, and doctors were able to save his very mangled pointer finger. He told this story every year at camp. This is amazingly well done. Both your storytelling, and the digitally impaired man's commitment. I worked as a camp counselor for a few summers and had a great signature ghost story. I don't really remember too many of the details but the gist was there was some ghost who would kill you unless you gave him two of your teeth and told him two other names of people to kill. It was a fine story but the real kicker came at the end of the night, when all my baby teeth had been replaced with adult teeth, two of them never came in and were missing. For a few years I had a retainer with two fake teeth to fill the gaps. Before sending the kids off to bed I would pop the retainer out in secret and give them a big old toothy smile. Scared the absolute bejesus out of the little buggers every time. That's amazing. The best campfire stories are the unique ones that can only be told because of a special prop like that. My family had one called the man in the corn, or beans in the corn. There was once a hobo who was stealing ears of corn from a local man's garden. Now food was hard to come by, and someone stealing that which you're growing was especially frustrating. The man saw the hobo in the garden and fired a shotgun shot over the hobo's head. The next day, the hobo was back there again stealing ears of corn. The man decided he would teach the hobo a lesson so he poured all the lead shot out of his shotgun shells and filled them with small dry beans. The very next day the hobo was back in the cornfield again, and the man fired twice on the hobo, and the hobo screamed and ran down the corn rows fast pleading the whole way. The man watched for days, but the hobo was never seen again. Some days later, the man still had been shells in his shotgun, so he aimed at a plank of wood standing over by his well. The plank ripped to pieces. When the next planting seasons came, the farmer walked his cornfield to its far corners, to cut corn husks and prepare to plow. Along the way, he found tiny bean plants coming up through the soil. One here, another there, all lining up to lead him to a big bunch of beans coming up along the edge of the field. When he went to exam the bunch of beans, he first saw shoe soles turn to one side, and then the outline of a body, sank in the mud and soil. He realized he had killed the hobo, and the random beans that had fallen out of his body had sprouted along the way. My father had bought that particular farm during the war years, and he said for 20 years, random bean plants would show up in that field. Any bean plant that showed up in our garden was given the chance to grow. And one year there was a bean planted that wrapped around a corn stalk. My father did not harvest the corn ears on that plant. If I remember right, that was an old farming technique corn, beans, and a particular squash. Each plant put into the soil what another took away, and growing up the strong corn stalks gave the beans support. There was a Brit who was driving through Ireland as the weather got progressively worse and day soon turned to night. He suddenly realized that he was on the wrong road but there was nowhere to turn around, so he pressed on, barely able to see the road through the rain. Without warning, his car just died. No battery, no engine. He assumed water must have shorted something and he'd best start walking. He was soaking wet in a hundred yards but he continued walking. An hour later, 
He heard a noise behind him and turned to see a car coming very slowly up the road behind him. Its lights very dim. As it reaches him he reaches out through the torrential rain and opens the back door and jumps in. Shocked, he is the only person in the car. There is no one driving and no other passengers. He freezes with fear as the car slowly continues up the road through the pouring rain. Before long a village comes into view and the car creeps silently and slowly into the village. The Brit spies a pub so he jumps out and runs inside, not looking back. Panting with horror, he orders a beer and sits down. A minute later two soaking wet Irishmen come into the pub. The taller one points at the Brit and says that's him Paddy. That's the bastard I saw jump out of the car we were pushing. Ha ha ha, love it. The golden arm, or at least the version my mom tells. A fellow is looking to be married to one of the rich merchant's daughters to gain the, the fortune that would come with her. Fortunately the merchant had an unmarried daughter still so the fellow begins to court her. The first thing he noticed is that she had a solid gold right arm. She apparently lost it in a childhood accident and her father had a golden arm forged for her. Seeing this as a sign of extreme wealth he continued with courting her, making her believe he truly loved her and not for her father's money. In turn she fell deeply in love with him. They get married and the fellow is given his riches along with part of the merchant business is now father-in-law owned, thus giving him more money. However, he soon realized his wife was now of no real use, so he ignored her, gave her gifts and had dinner with her but the love he said he felt had disappeared. Angry and heartbroken the daughter accused him of marrying her for her money, in which he boldly states of course. She was furious. Screaming about going to tell her father what a scoundrel he truly was and their riches would be stripped away along with his job. This angered the fellow. After all he worked so hard to get her here. He wasn't going to let her take it away. So he pushed her down the cellar stairs and let her snap her neck on the stone. He plead heartbroken to the grief stricken father. Losing his most favorite daughter. The fellow's riches intact. The fellow and family hold a funeral for the daughter and weep and cry. When it was but him and his dead wife he opened the casket and pulled out a saw. For she did not need her golden arm in the grave. That night he slept with the arm under his pillow. Not wanting even the servants to see it before he melts it down into bars. He slept soundly until a voice like the wind asks. Where's my golden arm? Slow and far away the voice echoed through the sleeping house. So quite he thought it was just a draft. Until the voice came again. Closer and louder this time. As it down the hall. Where's my golden arm? Sitting up the fellow looked around fearfully. Too scared to do anything as he hears again much closer. Where's my golden arm? He felt a heat on his back and a movement from under his pillow. But he was too scared to look away from the door as he hears again. Just outside the frame the wail of. Where's my golden arm? It felt like heck fire on his back as he felt the hot metal of the hand on his back. Seemly crawling on its own as he watches the doorknob turn. The maid found his body that morning, face frozen in horror and hair a bright white, hands still clutching the sheets around his body, but the strangest thing was that his dead wife's golden arm was on his chest, hand wrapped tightly around his throat. Sorry this is long but this is the first time I've written this story out it's always been verbally told. Excellent retelling, brings back memories. So a story I always tell around a campfire that I think is quite spooky is the legend of El Silban. The Whistling Ghost, it's a Venezuelan folk tale but I have a tradition of telling it. Anyway the legend goes that on cold dark nights in remote places especially in South America a whistle can be heard coming down the road. At first it will seem loud like it's right next to you but as time passes it begins to fade and get more and more quiet until it's almost gone. The trick is as El Silban's whistle gets louder he's further away and when he's right next to you the whistle is very faint and sounds like it's far away. Once El Silban is at your doorstep he will sit down and begin to count the skulls of his victims and you have to listen to him count every single skull or one of your family members will die soon after and become one of his skulls. El Silban is said to dress like a farmer with a large straw hat, torn clothes, ghostly aura and a pale dead face. It's not that scary but it's interesting. I've posted this before. One year, a group of us went camping in Kearney, Ontario where we always go camping. Whenever we go, we always form our tents in a big circle, with the fire pit in the middle of us. We've been drinking, smoking a few joints and a few of us were tripping balls on shrooms. The first night we were there, this guy randomly walks into our circle, introduces himself, 
I can't remember the name he gave, that he was in the military and decided to take some vacation to camp out a bit. He asked if he could join our fire, as it was getting late and he didn't buy any firewood. Being the friendly stoned people we are, we let him join our fire. He even pitched in some money for the firewood. The night went on and we all were having a good time. One by one, our group started heading off to bed, me being either the second or third. I remember waking up to the sound of someone talking and the fire being started, it was 4 in the morning. I peeped out my tent and saw the random just sitting on a log by the fire, talking to himself. Still tripping on shrooms, I thought to myself I am in no condition to deal with this and chalked it up to me just tripping out. I wake up the next day and everyone is still alive, thankfully, and the fire is smoldering. We look to the next campsite, where the random was staying and it was spotless. No garbage, no tracks in the trail around the site, no nothing. We all started talking about him, just to be sure we all saw him. Through talking, we managed to figure out that he must not have slept at all. The last two of our group passed out just after 330 am. The first person got up just after 6 am and noticed he was gone. The rest of the camping trip went well and we all went home. Fast forward maybe 4-5 or five years. I flip on the news and there is a picture of someone I could swear I recognize. He was arrested for a bunch of crimes, including rape and murder. Guess who it was? It was the random guy who joined our fire. I don't know why I remembered his face, but I guess it was just a weird situation where my brain right clicked and saved as a JPEG in my brain. Now, I have no way of proving if it was the same guy. We didn't take any pictures of the random. But the picture jump started my memory and made me instantly remember the weird random fire joiner. Either that, or they looked identical to the same person. Either way, was creepy. I lived in this house as a child that was rumored to have had a family murdered there. I was around 10 at the time. We used to see stuff here and there. Someone running past our peripheral etc. I even thought I saw a little girl at the end of the hallway once, but did a double take and she was gone. Well one week I kept having those falling dreams where you wake up right before you hit the ground, always waking up in a cold sweat. The last night this happened I didn't immediately open my eyes, but instead heard a high pitched cackle like a witch. When I finally came to, my blanket was hovering slightly above me, and in the corner of my closet is the little girl smiling at me. I pulled the covers over my head and eventually cried myself back to sleep. The best part of all this is we tried to tell my dad numerous times what we all witnessed in that house but he never bought it. When we eventually moved he had the power turned off a few days before we were actually set to be out, and on the last night as he was leaving grabbing the last box, he said he heard a voice that sounded like his mother's calling his name from the back of the house. He ran. My grandmother was still alive at that time, so it def wasn't her or her ghost. He told me this years later and said at first he thought he was hearing one of our dogs before realizing they were all gone. Comma he thought he was hearing one of our dogs before realizing they were all gone. Ouch, I'd be miffed if I was his mother and heard that one. I always liked the quick ones. There was a young girl playing in her room one day when she heard a voice that sounded like her mother's from the kitchen. Sweetie, come down here. The little girl jumped up and ran out the door where she suddenly ran into her mother at the top of the stairs. Her mother reached out and quickly covered the girl's mouth so she couldn't make a sound. Don't go down there, I heard it too, she said. I know two versions of this story, really like it. First one is it's a teenager who gets dragged into a hallway closet, only it's her mother, who heard the voice too. The other has the girl in the living room, who hears her mother call for her from upstairs. So she starts to head up the stairs, only to hear her mother call from the kitchen. It's pretty simple and I will not drag it out, so here it goes. One day my neighbor walked over into my backyard while I was in my garden. He looked disheveled and was wearing pajamas. When I stood up I noticed his eyes were sunken in and it looked as if he lost a lot of weight. I tried to crack a joke about how this would be a great day to go down to the beach if it were not for the weather being so cold. But the joke fell flat. A week later I bumped into his wife at the post office. She was in line in front of me mailing about a dozen packages. I asked if her husband was feeling better because he looked a bit under the weather last week when he was in my backyard. She tells me I must have been mistaken. He passed away over a month ago from cancer. 
The packages she was mailing were his action figure toy collection she sold online. I was speechless. Was I crazy? Maybe I did misjudge the weekend I thought I saw him. Then I really thought hard. I did not remember him saying anything to me. I did remember telling him the joke and it falling flat. I assumed I wasn't funny and that's why he didn't laugh. Or maybe he couldn't because it may have been just his spirit. When I returned home from the post office I immediately start telling my wife about our neighbor. Before I could get out he had passed away from cancer she says oh yeah I saw you guys talking last weekend. And then I tell her about seeing his wife at the post office and being told about his passing. So we go to our security camera and play back the video from the week before. It's clear in the video that I do stand up. It's obvious I'm acknowledging the presence of someone and have a brief conversation. And then I go back to tending to my garden. But on the video the entire time I was the only person in my backyard. That's a good spooky story. The lore of my cottage that my great great uncle watches over it. Mostly because I saw an apparition of a man at 2-3 in the morning when I was a young kid when I went to use the bathroom, rocking chairs would move by themselves. I once heard an unknown man speaking in my room at my cottage. But the only males at the time were my brother and I and my cousin. Except my brother and I were young kids, my cousin had just started puberty, and this sounded like an older man who smoked a lot. And a few years ago when another cousin was staying there, she saw an apparition of a man sitting at a computer chair in her room, the same room I stayed in as a kid. It's both creepy but assuring having someone watching over us. <laughs> Typical Filipino stories. Almost all schools are Catholic schools in my country and they're either built over a cemetery and or used to be a barracks hospital during World War II. Maria Labo. Though I think this one is just from our island but I do remember reading about it in a national horror magazine so it must have spread. Poor woman goes to London to work as a caregiver. She comes back as an aswang ghoul. Cooks up her children. Her husband finds out and slices her face with a labo or machete. Now she roams the countryside searching for her next meal. This caused so much panic in my town that the radio station had to issue a statement that it was just a folk tale. Tianak. If you're out hiking in the woods during dusk or night and you hear a baby crying, do not help it, just run away. It will eat you. Oh frick yeah finally, a baby gonna eat me. My vor fantasy has been blessed. I don't really know of a name for this but besides the ones you hear in elementary school like Black Box and the one with the girl and the dog, this is the one I know the best that's actually scary. A group of hikers were wandering through to woods looking for a place to stay at night when they came across a small cabin. They all decide to stay the night inside, seeing as there was no one there. Inside, the cabin is decorated with paintings of what seemed to be members of the family that used to own the cabin. The hikers spend the night looking at the paintings and making fun of how wonky they looked. In the morning, one wakes up to see the cabin full of morning light and looks around. The paintings are gone, in their place. Windows. I think I've heard this before somewhere but I don't remember where. Late at night, two doctors are finishing their shift at the hospital. As they get in the elevator, an elderly woman in patient's gown waves at them to wait but the older doctor lets the door close. Why didn't you wait for her asks the other doctor. Didn't you see her blue id bracelet? That's a morgue tag. The short ones are the ones that get me. The Dark Watchers. Specific to Pico Blanco Scout Reservation. They were the shadows that watch you. Best part was when scouts had to walk back to camp terrified of what was behind the trees. There were a couple that were, as far as I know, unique to the church camp. Camp Gala Maxon. I went to as a kid. Though I admit it's possible some of our stories were ubiquitous ones just adapted to the place. I don't really know. One of them, though. I do have first hand knowledge about, it's the story of Sydney. The camp was established on an old piece of property that has been a lot of different things over the years. Back during the war, it was a girls boarding school. One girl who was there was deeply in love with a boy who had gone off to fight. They exchanged letters constantly, until one day the letters stopped coming. Few weeks later, she gets word that her beloved was killed in action. She was so distraught that she hanged herself in her dorm room. There's still a plaque by the door of the room in her memory. Now, I know for a fact that room is haunted. I stayed in that room one year when I worked for the camp. One night after lights out, the fan came on by itself. 
It started spinning faster and faster until it started wobbling really hard, acting like it's about to fall off. I knew the stories, so I shouted, stop it, Sydney, I'm a friend. Fan immediately stopped, like, not just slowed down and came to an eventual stop, it's like someone grabbed the fan blades and stopped it. That sounds scary even if you don't believe in ghosts. This is a pretty common one but it always scared the crap out of my little cousins. Here it goes. There once was a girl named Mary Sue. She would always wear a bow around her neck. The kids at school would always say, Mary Sue, Mary Sue, take off that bow will you but she refused. In high school, her best friends asked her to take it off as they had gone out of fashion but Mary Sue refused. One day Mary Sue met the man of her dreams and he asked her to take off her bow but she replied, One day you will find out. Almost 60 years later, after Mary Sue's children had grown up and moved out Mary Sue went up to her husband. Do you want to see what is under my bow she asked. Her husband put down his newspaper. Are you sure? You've never taken it off. I am sure my love, Mary Sue said pulling the end of her bow. The bow fell to the ground shortly followed by her head and the rest of her body. I've always loved this one as a kid. We have old one here in Saar, a farmer, while on his way home, is caught in a terrible thunderstorm with his horse. Completely lost he realizes he will either freeze to death or get struck by lightning if he doesn't find a place to stay. Through the storm, he comes across a small homestead, the yellow candlelight visible through the sheets of rain. Lighting flashes brightly, thunder barely a breath later, and he leads his terrified horse to the small house. Tying the petrified animal to the fence, he knocks on the door and an old lady opens it with a smile. She ushers him in and he finds her husband smoking a pipe. He is seated at the kitchen table, and the wife quickly boils the kettle and gives him a bowl of hot soup and a cup of coffee. The farmer tells the old couple his story, and they are happy to serve as his sanctuary against the storm. Outside the lightning flashes again, followed with a bout of thunder, and the old man smiles when jumps offering him a bit of tobacco for his pipe to calm his nerves. The farmer accepts gratefully. The next bolt slams close, ripping through the ground, almost deafening him completely. He jumps up with a cry, startled out of his wits, only to find himself standing in the dark and cold, soaked wet by the rain, with no sign of the couple, broken stones littered around him, and his horse tied to a tree branch. Without thinking, he jumps on his spooked horse and gallops as fast as he can away from the place. He would reach a town sometime during the night, at a tavern. After sharing his story, the folks tell him of the small cottage nearby which had been struck by lightning a long time ago, and of the couple that was killed in the fire. This is somewhat wholesome. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.